Miro, obviously great pleasure to have you here. Welcome you to JLFR, year zero JLF Suneva Fushi. We were supposed to do this last September, and Mira was going to be in the middle of a film shoot. So as it happened, uh, <laughs> the festival got postponed, and we've had the great privilege of having her here today. Mira, we've just come out of this beautiful session by B.N. Goswami, who said, you have to bring respect to art. Uh, and we've seen that. And most people always uh, pay lip service and say, you know, especially in India, our great classical heritage and the arts, etc. But we don't see the kind of respect that art really should claim for itself because it really is transformative. Your films have shown us how art can make a difference in the world. Will you tell us a little bit about whether you do this consciously or whether it's just part of your DNA about the way that you've chosen your films and, and, and very considered films, whether it's The Queen of Katwe or Mississippi Mans uh, Masala or Salam Bombay and so many others. So tell us a little bit about your trajectory and how you created this, these very beautiful films. Thank you, Sanjoy, and thank you, Suneva Fushi, for, for allowing art to be discussed with such seriousness and reflection as the great BNG, as he was called almost, I thought it was natural gas for a minute, but it's BN Goswami, uh, was uh, talking about how some painting, you know, makes one, asks you to breathe gently, to breathe quietly as you reflect upon it. And uh, this is the extraordinary tradition that we have come from, and we often forget we have come from that. You know, my tradition or trajectory really started in a very small place, uh, Bhubaneswar, Orissa, where I was born, uh, in where my father was an uh, IAS officer, setting the new capital, actually, of the state, uh, a place where the Jatra, the, the mythological theater, would come through, the not even a city, it was a town, and I was uh, riveted by this theater, you know, where I would go with, with no one would know I was gone, but I would go and it was like just a couple of props, uh, you know, staircases to nowhere, lots of bhang, a lot of, uh, you know, extraordinary chanting of the Prahlad Nataka, uh, you know, the triumph of good over evil with literally three actors who were high and completely possessing us to go into great sort of realms of, of, of thought, uh, really, and an action, actually. And so it was the theater that possessed me very early on, when I was 12 or 13. And I pursued this first as a young student in Tara Hall in Loretta Convent in Simla, where Shakespeareana and then Barry John came along with his ensemble theater and so on. But um, I very quickly, after school, studied with Badal Sharkar, who is from this extraordinary tradition of radical, socially conscious play, writing, directing, take, and we would create our own plays in Northern Calcutta when I was 16, and we would go out into the streets and try to engage, and of course there were thousands of people who would come. But the quest for me, like you, we, we come from a society where you live cheek by jowl with those who have and those who have not anything, you know, and that was never an easy marriage for me. It was always a baffling thing that my best friends were my cook's children who then had to retire to their little room when I went to do my homework, you know, and it was always a very shocking thing, actually, as well as a deeply, deeply familiar thing. So this was the quest, you know, can one make anything in the realm of art, I didn't even use the word art till very late in life, that could change anything at all, you know. And it was Badalda who, who tried and who worked it, but, and what was extraordinary about him was what he, he was creating a new form, you know, in, in creating political street theater. But still, I, I was, I did not feel that that was the, you know, could it make a difference? Anyway, that took me much, further into performance as an actor in Delhi. Again, we were subjected to pretty much colonial theater, you know, English comedies and Shakespeare and so on. And that dissatisfaction with that actually led me to a scholarship in America when I was 18. 
ostensibly to continue to be an actor, to work with Peter Brook and Grotowski and Joseph Chaikin and people who were my heroes in the books, you know, before. And I did some of that, I did a lot of that, but I had to return to university to study because it was a scholarship and I had to do. And that was when I fell into, or chose to fall into, what was called cinema verite filmmaking, which is uh, cinema of truth. And this uh, idea of photographing life uh, to subjects of subjects that interested me, whether it be who decides who is a good woman, you know, which became India Cabaret, a documentary I made in um, 1984, or others, you know, why are women aborting male fetuses in Children of Desired Sex, which I made in 1985. Uh, th th this, was a sub this was a medium that could encompass so many questions and yet speak to at least more than a few people who would gather to see a play, you know. So it was that 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 was it was seven years of those films films that my family even did not see because documentary was not known Chandni Bar. yeah it was not i mean they influenced these films into in influenced a lot of uh, feature films later but i'd like Chandni Bar. um but they you know again i felt the lack of an audience the wanting to make uh, to reach people you know and that amalgam of understanding political theater, of understanding performance through being an actor, and of living on the streets with these, like with India Cabaret, I lived in Ghatkopar in the Cabaret house for six months. My parents in Delhi. Ghatkopar is a little sort of, so, or certainly then was yeah. a little suburb yeah. in Bombay that no respectable person, person would should enter. be seen. Yeah. I was very happy. I saw a beautiful show of paintings last week in Delhi uh, by Atul Dodia. And I asked him, you know, where he lived. And, and he said, oh, you would never know it. And I said, just try me. And he said, Ghatkopar. <laughs> I said, I knew Ghatkopar before he did, you know. Anyway, um, and then I lived in Antofi, as they called it. I never knew Antofi means Antop Hill, which is where the cabaret dancers lived, and I lived with them for months, you know, before I brought the camera into their lives. Um, so knowing these worlds that were completely marginal to the Delhi world that I lived, I came from, um, not just was uh, where I felt at home. It was also terribly, terribly disheartening and also ugly. And of course, I was considered a stripper for months and months by the men around. Um, but it's a way of seeing something starkly, you know. It's a way of seeing something without having that constant veil of class that protects us and numbs us from from what we see and experience. Anyway. But it was also a desire to reach audiences, to change things, but to work, like also B. N. Goswami said, to work uh, in the all-encompassing way of cinema, to work with poetry, to work with light, to work with music, to work with the human emotion. That led me to make my first feature film, which was Salam Bombay in 1987-88. Um, again... So, so hold that for a second, Mira Salam sure. Bombay. You know, is it that people like us, people of privilege, does that give us, uh, in many ways, the, what you said, the protection to be able to go out and do this? Or does that, in some sense, remove us I think it removes. Uh, in many ways? I think it numbs us. When I finished Salam Bombay and it became this instant, you know, won the camera door and went up to the Oscars and became this super kind of uh, phenomenon, actually, at the time, I remember coming back to India and all my Indian director friends, Govind Nehlani and Ketan Mehta, and friends of mine would come and see me and say, you know, this is an international film and I, I have an international film idea. It will be Michael Caine and it will be Ben Kingsley. And, and I just looked at them and I said, you know, <laughs> you don't need Ben Kingsley and Michael Caine. You need to just be able to be clear eyed of what is outside your car window, you know, because that was what Salam Bombay is. But the thing is, the way we live, it numbs us, it, it teaches us not to see, because if we see and if we feel, we don't do, it would be, it could be, I suppose, destructive. I think for me, it was leaving India. It was becoming a student in the an anonymity of elsewhere, you know, of where I was not anyone and not known, and yet very much there in order to return home, not really there to be there, you know, only there. 
but to discover who I was and what I was looking for, I suppose. And it was very confusing too. You don't know quite who you're speaking to when you're in the West, especially in the 80s where no one knew about India. I remember when we were nominated for the uh, Academy Award, uh, they didn't know how to pronounce India when they announced Salam. <laughs> they didn't know how to pronounce Salam. I mean, forget about you know anything else. And, and forget about Suni Tarapurwala's name, you know, the script writer. He was like, how the hell are they going to do that? But um, so it wasn't, it wasn't about, it was deeply, in fact, a great loneliness of always wanting to make films about my own place, uh, but not speaking to people from there and not speaking to actually people at home because you were like, I used to call myself Dobi Ka Kutta, you know, Na Ghar Ka, Na Ghat Ka. And that is what it is, you know. Um, but that, I think, perhaps, in retrospect, gave me that kind of clarity of how to see and what to see. Uh, and maybe the whole, this trajectory that you asked of, this trajectory of going from street theater to really not, or to, to embracing always the margin of society gave me the courage to make Salam Bombay, but to make it as a feature film, make it with control, not make it in the hit and run style, which the Cinema Verite documentaries were about. For those of you who don't know, Salam Bombay uh, was a film about street children where Mira cast street children. Barry John came in and did a workshop, and the rest, as they say, is cinema history. And it really, in many ways, 33 years ago, 34 years ago, uh, when street children wasn't necessarily um, what it is today, somewhat fashionable, more fashionable than it was then, it caught the imagination of the people and then Salam Balak Trust was founded. But Mira, going back to your America sojourn, you were a person of color, though that was still not a politically appropriate word at that point of time. How did you imbibe that and how did that then reflect in Mississippi Masala, for example? Well, um, before... Can I just say one thing about Salam Bombay? Salam Bombay was also very much encouraged. I, I had the spark to finally say, I'm going to do this, because I saw this great Brazilian film called uh, Pichot, uh, Hector Babenko's film about street kids, in, uh, which was an amazing film. And I went to a speak, uh, speech of his at the Museum of Art, and I, it just knocked me out. And I went to talk to him. I didn't know him. And I thought, if he can do this, then maybe I can do this too. I was about 27 years old or 26 years old. And, and then I went off and started to make it. And the day we began shooting in Bombay, uh, I read the Times of India, and it, the boy playing Pishot in that film had just been murdered that day. And it was just like a, 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 a message to me that this can never happen uh, to what I was about to do, you know. And always from the beginning, we had talked about uh, making a place that was safe and honored children of the street. You know, that was Salam Balak Trust later. So that was the determination from the get-go. But how to do it unfolded. So that was what, why also, you know, and to go back to the original question, whether art can in any way change the world. It is very hard to do that, but Salam Bombay, and you, and all of the people who really made Salam Balak Trust together, which was in 1989. 1989, 33 1989, years ago. 1989, with the profits of some of the profits of the film, uh, really have, have actually, as you know, impacted government policy in this country about street kids and, and is a vibrant organization. Thanks to all of you, and thanks to also the emphasis we have in Salam Balak on the arts. Uh, you know, So it's kind of like a full circle. Um, it really gives me no... The, the only problem is that most of the kids then look at us and like, we also want to make, you know, be <laughs> artists. And I'm like, you know, be a banker, join, join the services, do anything, but do the arts. But so many of them have become so successful. Uh, yeah, and we have uh, nine and a half thousand kids every year who come yeah, to us. And there's really a lot, lot to do with Sanjoy and the great board that run this organization. So... With, with, to answer your next question, it, it was being a brown kid in the middle of black and white and, and 
also being educated in a very post-colonial world in India where I was, I can recite Portia to you in one minute, I can do this, I can do that, you know, but Kabi Kalidas Hamne Padabine, you know, we've never even been taught our own poets until much, much later when I sought them, you know. So even though I was adept in Western, you know, things, but coming to the States, um, I found myself very uh, much in the swing between the black and the brown and the white communities in our university, and that gave me the idea of uh, trying to explore it, what I call the hierarchy of color, and that gave me the idea of my second film. Even though after Salam Bombay, I was offered every film on every child of every hue, but I had good good sense to uh, ignore that and go back to my own instinct, which is really the only way to keep going and probably the reason I'm here, uh, it, to make what became Mississippi Masala, because I read about these two strange things of, um, in Uganda, Idi Amin had expelled Asians after three generations of living there, and 72, they all had to leave in given 90 days. And, um, and on the other side, in Mississippi, which was the birthplace of the American civil rights movement, a lot of these exiles, Asian, Ugandan exiles, came to own these dirt poor hotels, motels. In fact, it was called Patel Motels, and still is. Um, and I wondered, you know, what would happen? It was just a fiction in my mind. What would happen if an uh, Asian girl from a place that would call Africa her home would come to the place of the African Americans and would cross the border into an interracial love story with a black man. And this was 19, um, when was it? 1989, when we start started researching this. I asked my dear friend, Suni Tarapurwala, who, who wrote Salam with me and, and who, to come. And uh, we, again, crisscrossed the hotels. Those days, uh, my films were completely born out of social science research, like interviewing hundreds of people, both in Mississippi and living with them and then going to East Africa, first time in that continent, um, and understanding what had happened there. What was this dream that people had left, you know? And that was what, uh, and, and then we wrote it really for a young actor I had seen in one film um, who was riveting, Denzel Washington. and. Um, you know, I was I was considered successful with that one film. It had also made money, Salam Bombay. So I was seeing a lot of Hollywood types to finance Mississippi Masala. And they literally asked me, one of them, you know, he said, well, this is all very well, but can you make room, he said, for a white protagonist? And, and I smiled at him and I said, you know, I promise you all the waiters in this film will be white. Uh, and and, and he, uh, he, he laughed and I laughed and I was essentially shown the door. But even with, of course, Denzel was unknown at the time and then became very known. Even while we were shooting the film, he won the Oscar for glory. So he was instantly known after that. But um, even with him, uh, at that time, 1989, 90, there was no black film. There was no, I mean, anything that they could consider, and certainly no black-brown film, you know. So the movie came out, and uh, so it, there is this um, razor-sharp kind of, I always say I have to have the skin of an elephant while keep, keeping the heart of a poet, because you, I'm always like in this slightly pioneering space, which is sounds all very nice when it's all uh, successful way after the fact, but when you're in it, it's a deeply kind of lonely, and it m makes you makes you tough. It it really I, I begin to um, trust rejection. I, I almost sometimes want it because it spurs me to say, okay, I'll just show you. You know what we can do. So, but Mississippi Masala was um, actually a really good success, and and spoke to the hybrid uh, the hybrid person in all of us at that time as well. But then, after about two years of playing, pretty much disappeared from the world until a year and a half ago when I was asked for a print by the Br British Film Institute and I, with great difficulty, found one at the bottom of a Nashville, Tennessee music company that now owned by just the weirdness of, you know, one studio selling to another. Yeah, the rights of this film. And they were so good to me and kind that they gave me back the film. So now, 
we own the rights to Mississippi Masala and, and Criterion Films, which is the greatest sort of film company in the States in terms of restoring old films. We have restored it and remixed it. Um, and it is now playing in theaters across America as of April 15th. Also, Denzel has never made a romantic film. It's the only romantic hero he played. And so, of course, there's all this interest in his uh, fabulous torso and, 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 and so on. But, uh, and also, it is the origin, it is the debut of uh, Sarita Chowdhury, this extraordinarily uh, successful, now successful, uh, Bangladeshi, a uh, fantastic girl whom I saw on a bicycle in London and I just wanted that girl, you know, to play uh, Mina in the movie. So it's a very beautiful uh, kind of coming around, you know, full circle of how Mississippi Masala now is like ultimately fashionable because black lives matter and so and people of color matter and all of this we suddenly matter and and uh, here it is, you know, 30 years, 32 years later. So that's been a sweet... Uh, Sweet uh, but you know, you said that people of color matter. Do they matter? If you look at many of your films, yeah. identity has been one of the strong anchoring bits. If you look at, say, Zoran, your own son, uh, in the 70s and 80s, if he was born, he would be seen as an ABCD, uh, Asian born, confused, Desi, or Asia, Africa born, confused, Desi. Has that changed? Have young people come into their own people of color and is there an acceptance in your industry, mm -hmm. specifically? In the visual arts industry, it's still pretty much uh, you know, exotic, and only then will you be shown in a MoMA or get a place at the Met or wherever. But certainly in the film industry, has that changed? In our industry, I can say that it, we have been shamed, they have been shamed into making us at least be now, not if not the center, but sometimes the mascot or the forefront of, of, um, of being in mainstream things. But is that ticking the box or is there genuine? It is, genuine? I, mean, I, you know, I'm a healthy elephant who, <laughs> who, who, who doesn't, uh, you know, get seduced that easily. Um, and I know that we are currently very much, not just the flavor of the year perhaps, but uh, but they have to open the doors to whom they have ignored for so long because God knows that we are really the color of America as well. You know, diversity is the real power of America for a long time, but it certainly has not been open to being received in the mainstream over the 30, 40 years that I have worked there, even though I'm considered, you know, successful and all of that. But now... Uh, they have to, you know, everyone has signed mandates that you've got to, you know, hire women and hire people of color and so on. I have to say, um, having just finished a very big uh, sort of American mainstream series called National Treasure in which I was, uh, I just con um, conceived of, the, directed the pilot, which is the first hour, um, which is about, anyway, it's about a Mexican girl who, has a clue mind that unlocks the national treasure. And these are iconic movies that came out 15 years ago with Nicolas Cage. Um, and I was surprised that they would ask me, but they asked me because they loved Queen of Katwe and they loved this and that, whatever. But also I wanted to do it because it was somewhat a non-white America that was being portrayed. But on the other hand, you know, I do feel that sometimes uh, it is, it is, uh, you know, you'll have Priyanka Chopra playing in Quantico, but she's playing an American FBI officer. You know, she's not, and she's playing somebody who's involved with the terror, you know, the terrorist search as always. So sometimes it's just the face of things that might have changed, but the form and the, 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 the artistic or political language in it is the same with different, different, face to it. But I would say there is a lot of, um, there is a big wake up call in the Academy of Motion Pictures where I'm an active member, um, just changing the constituency of the over 65 
white men who ran it uh, into really creating and pushing for a diversity in its membership of, of heralding uh, directors and writers and cinematographers and sound folks from all over the world. And is that why we saw such a, is that, that's in why some you sense, saw, a different nomination Exactly, that's uh, why you saw this Parasite year. as a best picture, because it would never have happened had the voting block been the same. Now the voting block is increasingly different every year. So cinema itself is being regarded as a much more international treasure box, which it always was, but it, the Academy was the Academy, and it heralded a lot of its own, you know. So n that, that makes a difference when the ground changes. Uh, but the subject matter is still up to us to not be seduced by the fact that we can be invited to the tables of directing mainstream. It's like, what are we directing is the question, you know, for me, always. What are we putting out? If we don't tell our own stories, who will tell them? That is my burning question every time. I'm going to come back to telling of the stories, but going back to identity and color, in the music industry, especially in America, for example, you see a much, much greater diversity and acceptance that that black or African-Caribbean or African-American uh, music star can become that overwhelming star, much more than in film. Why is that? that? Is there a popular street cred that accepts that, whereas the more haloed uh, envision of a, of a theater is barring? And will that change with the way that social media and the way that films are today screened? Do you see that changing? Will there be a, a, a change and make that far more popular, in a sense, because you can click on your laptop? Well, I don't know fully the answer, but cinema requires millions of dollars and millions of rupees and, and is a hugely collaborative environment in which I think a singular vision must guide it. But it requires uh, uh, interlocuting you know, wheels upon wheels to actually make happen. Music can be, especially with technology the way it is, a, sing a talent can make music in your basement. Not to say that it could become uh, hugely successful easily. That still requires the wheels of... But this sound of what has come from the street, you could say, or what has come from a long tradition, uh, is much more uh, able to be made and therefore much more able to be heard. So I have, I have personally seen so much of... Uh, of this happening, where in cinema it's still rare because it's, it's, it requires so much more. Um, but since you ask, I'm now making a big musical film with Pharrell Williams, who's a great, uh, great, uh, great musician and also a superstar. But when they asked me to do something like that, I thought, especially imbued with Mississippi Masala, revived right now and really speaking to the young, now, because they haven't seen Black Brown for all these decades, and not that it's you know been made even since then. Um, I thought if it's Pharrell, then I'm going to make what Mississippi Masala perhaps could be today, which is uh, a romance between a musician and uh, who's black and a, a young Indian woman who is they wanted a Bollywood mu a movie star. And you know, that is today, uh, uh, anyway, what, is ha what happens and what is happening. Anyway, so that's one of the things that I'm cooking up these days is a new feature film with, uh, with his music, Pharrell's music, and uh, a crossing again from Atlanta to Bombay, you know. Um, so now people are, even they, they gulp when I say, oh, but you know, he, he, he <laughs> I don't want to, it should be a black man or it should be a person of color, whatever. They say, oh, okay, all right. They have to kind of take it. But then they, they love it, you know, but, um, but uh, I think this will, this is certainly about speaking to people of today because we are now, you know, uh, we are so deeply hybrid and fluid and, and moving that we, this is our world, you know. What was interesting was, in fact, last, last week I was in London and the producers of Life of Pi asked me to come and see uh, the production. And the design is absolutely astonishing. I mean, beautiful design. Uh, but it was the first time after um, Bombay Dreams, which was, of course, seen to be in the Bollywood genre, but it's the first time to see a mainstream production on the West End mm -hmm. where people weren't 
looking at color as the, or identity as the primary thing, but just the story, barring two people from India who had come out and they were sitting behind me in the dress circle and one said to the other, ye to unhone ka musical hai. Meaning, they said that it was a musical. Isme to music hi nahi hai. There's no music in this uh, life of pie. What are we doing? But it's the same two people at the end of the show that stood with the rest of the audience to give it a standing ovation because it was stunning. But going back to telling of stories, Mira, you know, you were offered Harry Potter to direct at some point of time and with millions of dollars or whatever to do that. And uh, you just said no and you went on to make your own film. So what is that volition that drives you to to this kind of storytelling? I mean, Queen of Cutway, again, is not, it's not a story that would be coming out of Hollywood in general. Yeah. It's a story that could succeed in the way that you so beautifully portrayed it. It's about this young street kid who plays chess and breaks out of her uh, slum and house. What makes you, what gives you that volition to find these stories? Do stories find you? Do you go looking for stories? You know, now I've been telling stories, what, 30, 40 years, and I have understood the privilege of being inspired by something that I just have to tell. And it wasn't so easy to say no to Harry Potter, but but it was because I was deeply involved with adapting and just two months before shooting the namesake. And the namesake was inspired by, by grief. Namesake is of course a great, great story by Jhumpa Lahiri. And, um, and I had just lost my mother-in-law, uh, my like a, totally apparent to me, and we had buried her in this snowing Siberian snowstorm in New Jersey. Uh, she was very far from East Africa where she came from, and I had never experienced that finality of loss, and it was in that melancholy that I read Jhumpa's book, and I just, it spoke to me reams, you know, I felt like I had a sister in the world in this story, and immediately she gave it to me to adapt, and Suni was writing the most beautiful screenplay for it. Anyway, I was deep in it, and then this offer of Harry Potter came, and I had just finished Vanity Fair, Thackeray's Vanity Fair, and they loved that film, the Warner Brothers, and they wanted me to do this one. Also, Alfonso Cuaron had made the third one, and this was the fourth one, and I guess they began to trust the foreigner, you know, to direct these things, and there I was. And my son had learned to read, like many of our children, on Harry Potter. And so I couldn't not take it seriously. Um, and I did the meetings, but my heart was in the namesake. And I finally went to my 14-year-old and I said, Bita, kya kare? And he said, Mama, he said, anybody good can make Harry Potter, but only you can make the namesake. And, and you know, he, he just was amazing. He, he just liberated me in one line, you know. And I, none of this is a fake. This is absolutely true. And, and, um, and it is one of like my purest films uh, in the sense that no one messed with me while making it. And Irfan, whom I adore and who had, I had sort of found to come to Salam Bombay at the age of 18 to play a Salim, a big role was, I had, had to uncast him just moments before we shot because he was so tall and he didn't look like a malnourished street kid. And I said, Irfan Bhai, I will never forget you and I will come back for you. And it took 15 years to come back to Irfan, although we remained very close friends through it, you know, to offer him Ashok Ganguly. I was thinking of him just this morning, Ashok Ganguly also, because there is that line, uh, pack a pillow and blanket and see the world, you will never regret it. And that is a, a big uh, philosophy and credo for me, especially coming here to the Maldives uh, where literally the oceans meet and unite. And we were listening to that beautiful talk yesterday by Franco Pan about, um, about you know, the amalgam of culture and language here. And uh, I think for me that is, that is very much the um, inspiration really for um, Believing that uh, talent is porous, uh, borders must be porous, creativity is porous, you know. And um, anyway, that's how I came to say no to Harry Potter. And, and um, I, I did not regret it because we must do what, what 
calls to you, you know, and, and I think it's having made several things and sometimes being fallow and not inspired, I know how now, you know, ins to be inspired by something, to make it, is very important and also quite rare because many of us can get just absorbed in doing the job. And I am grateful to say that I have not really done the job <laughs> in many things, you know. Uh, and Queen of Katwe was very much, uh, I live in Kampala now, 30 years. This slum where Fiona Motesi, the real story, the real girl, was 15 minutes from my home. It's very much like Salam Bombay in the sense of, this is true, you know, a girl in the search of porridge goes to a church which ch t teaches chess in return for porridge. And she fights all the boys to get that porridge and ends up being this great mental strategist that will make her a grandmaster at the age of 13. And she plays Kasparov and um, wins $25,000 and buys her parents and family out of the slum and now lives in a home of her own in which I'm also a gardener and I came and planted the garden and every time a flower used to bloom, they would send me a picture of that flower. So, you know, it's all about also continuity and threads of like how we did with Salam Balak Trust. It's very much like that with Queen of Katwe because it set up a whole chess network of chess, you know, for kids uh, across Uganda and many things like that. But I just believe that if you can make things that uh, change, something, it's a, a powerful thing, uh, yeah. Going back to identity again, you know, today jingoism, national boundaries, political boundaries are just so emphasized and over important. And yet you inhabit three different spaces, your Riverside Drive in New York, which is a particular kind of life. And then you have a Kampala, where you have your beautiful home. And you live uh, at times in India. So in your home, in your head, is there a problem with who you are or the places that you inhabit? Or, or is it okay to say that you can be a sum of all of these different parts and you don't necessarily have to say, I am X or I am Y or I subscribe to just a particular didactic view of nationalism or in today's more enhanced word, patriotism? Well, to live in three continents is not without complication. Um, as I get older and as my mom gets older, I just want to be only with her and only in Delhi. And I will be and largely am now in Delhi. Um, but one thing that it has constantly teaches me to, to have this expansive worldview is that it teaches me humility. You know, it teaches me that what is meaningful in one place is absolutely meaningless in the other place, you know. So you can be in New York City and I can be deeply disappointed that my film did not get the Academy campaign it deserved because X film got whatever it is, you know, and you you have, you suffer, you know, you think, I know this is called campaign for a reason, it's called because they have to put money into what they choose and they choose the white horse and not the <laughs> brown one and you can suffer. Then you go to Uganda where there are no movie theaters for ever, you know, and it just doesn't matter who the hell is, you, you know, those, those races are meaningless. You look at other things and this kind of shift, even now the atmosphere in India, which is so, you know, so not who we are in terms of coming from the syncretism of this amazing country, of the plurality of our place, of our culture, of our language, of our music, and now they're trying to singularize it in a way that is so, it's just, it just crushes the spirit, you know? And it is dangerous. Uh, um, it is, it, it just sort of holds my throat, you know? But w something about movement, you know, enables at least to some extent to look at things um, askance, you know? And to try and mine from that something that one could tell that perhaps could, I don't know, stand the test of time or, or cut through it, you know, and remind us from whence we came. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a juggling act, you know, but, um, and I think as I get older, I might want to simplify it. <laughs> but right now, um, 
even so right so how does zoran see himself yeah, and for those of you who don't know zoran uh, their son uh, stood for a councillorship in new york was elected and then there's a whole taxi strike which i'll ask mira to share with us oh. but how does zoran see himself as this well zoran is uh, you know born in uganda uh, very uh, he only spoke urdu most of his life uh, he's a very adept as a Indian, you know, so he, he, when he was 10, he set up a new uh, country in his yearbook uh, called Yugindia. <laughs> and and uh, as he reminded me that he stood for every election that he could and, uh, when he was six years on. Anyway, he won this amazing New York City election and now is a proper politician with the Democratic Socialist Alliance and works closely with AOC and so on, and really represents Astoria, Queens. And very much and very openly, as the first South Asian, Ugandan, Muslim, um, you know, assemblyman, you know. And I guess he does embody this multiplicity of, of cultures as well as politics that we have set him off on. But now is the time, it seems, where he could, a person like him, could be embraced, you know. Uh, he doesn't ever appear without a kurta, you know, in the assembly or whatever it is, you know. It's, this is who I am and take it, you know. But mostly what I see in him is the young that are galvanized by not just his presence, but by the idea that they could make a difference, you know? So that is a very inspiring thing that I'm seeing. And is that the big change that you're seeing in America today? Huge this change, change of hope for young, from young people? Huge change. And that people like our kids who could probably become Wall Street folks or, you know, fancy this or executives here or, you know, writers and editors are choosing to actually get into people politics, you know? This is not something I'm yet seeing in India yet, but I mean I am by other by people I you know not uh, I don't know, but but there I'm really seeing it on the level of the grassroots, and I'm also seeing incredible change, like like with the taxi strike that he became a very strong part of and really won a big victory on. Yeah. Before I open it up, one two quick questions. One is that many of your movies is about loss, memory, um, and pain, uh, you know, and they sort of go through all your films. Where does that come from in one sense? And the second thing is, you know, we were talking about narrative and you were talking about this young people's narrative, which has come to be accepted in America. In India, one of the things that we're seeing is that the narrative of hatred uh, is so strong. The narrative of bad news or false news is, is huge. The narrative of good news has no space. So what is it that people like us are doing wrong in terms of finding that particular narrative to push back against hatred and make the good story, the, the story of hope, uh, a story that could go viral much more than the story of hatred and lynching and violence and everything that goes with that? You want it all, huh, Sanjay? Um, um, well, the first uh, about being making the narrative of loss and loss of memory. For me, it's I guess it's much more about exile. Uh, in my case, it was not uh, imposed; it was uh, voluntary movement, you know. And that I find cinema it really lends itself to understanding what it feels like to look outside the window here or look at the ocean and and see and feel like you have, you're in your garden in Kampala, or whatever, that kind of movement into another plane is almost more powerful with cinema than it is with literature, uh, for me, you know? And the fact that, like, like uh, BNG was saying so beautifully, that, you know, he was talking about how paintings uh, is, asks you to, the way he thinks of painting, asks you to bring in the music, the poetry, the, 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 the song of, uh, to, to look at the interpretation of a painting. I find that so much about cinema because it, it encompasses all these arts to make something, you know. Um, for The Suitable Boy, uh, I, I always wanted to be born in 1950. You know, I wanted to create, be a part of that creation of a new country that my parents had done. And for me, it was a, it was a passage 
to go back to that, if I could, you know, with Vikram's beautiful novel. Um, so that is what I, I listen to. I listen to, because, you know, when you make a movie, you have to live in that, you have to choose to live in that world, and you have to live in it for two to three years sometimes. And you have to love it every day. I, I sometimes tell actors, and I amuse them, and I say, I have to, I have to be in love with you for three years. You know, can you do it, you know? <laughs> Because I have to love love looking at you <laughs> for so long, and um, so that, so I am always propelled by that passion, and it's sometimes very uh, baffling to other people. But that's what draws me. In terms of the narrative of uh, hatred and Lynch, you know, I mean, look at what's happening in the in the streaming world, in, especially in our country. They have perfected the art of bludgeoning you into firstly demanding action at all times and hysteria at most times. The quietness or the quietude or the rhythm of a season or time is now not even, I mean, that's not just in India, it's actually a lot of places. The rhythm of what cinema asked for, which was a two hour or three hour, you know, surrender to to a rhythm of a kind is almost gone, you know. One has to hold on to it and remember it, you know. Or, or use this other narrative, which is the streaming, you know, six hours, but try to create that. It's very tough, it's really tough, because the people are asking you to bludgeon themselves with this kind of, you know, what we call the background score as well as the composed score. I never understood that. Where, you have this score that tells you exactly what to think, and then another score that's supposed to inform the emotion. I um, really, re I shrink from that, you know. I, I try to preserve something that is how I would like to see the world, but, but at the same time, I am not a pessimist, and I, and I, and I feel like one has to make things that amplify the world, uh, that one has to, make things that finally give you the courage to live and to believe and to um, and to hope also. But not just to hope, but to be able to make it, you know. I think when I meet our kids from Salam Balak Trust and I feel low, let's say, and I meet these kids and I see what they're doing and the joy with which they can bring up a puppet in their hands and then next moment, you know, choreograph, uh, three, 30 other kids and suddenly there is drama happening with nothing in their hands. It's, it gives me hope, you know, it gives me, li it lights that fire. And that is the secret of how we have to continue. Uh, and it would be, be best to make something that I hope, you know, could, could feed that fire. Propelling hope on that happy note. Any questions from the audience? Uh, not 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 compulsory, but anybody wants to ask anything, otherwise I'll go ahead, Shivani. Hello, I put on glasses. I have a very loud voice. I don't even think I need this. Okay. <laughs> so you know, when uh, I was growing up, uh, cinema and TV was something you did, which was considered a little less required less concentration than reading. And today, uh, it's something of huge concentration compared to staring at your smartphone, right? So as somebody making a movie. Would you rethink things to grab people's attention? Because people are so distracted, they're scrolling, they're watching, they're, you know. So would you have to rethink something by yourself? You mean to make a film or to make yeah, a streaming thing? Yeah, to conceive thing? of a film or anything or where you film. require a person to concentrate for 60, 90 minutes or longer. I would say yes. I mean, in making a like a six hour mini series, limited series, you know, is a little bit of a different vocabulary uh, right. and language than let's say making a two hour cinema film, right. feature film. I would say that there's definitely a different, uh, almost a different form that is required of what, what they call in the movies, uh, the cliffhanger is necessary for the limited series or any television thing, because you have to end the episode with a de right. desire to watch more. And I'm just, you know what I mean? You have to be propelled into sure. watching the next one. So yes, it does require a difference in 
in editing, in, in pacing, in storytelling, in fact. I, I used to think, even with making Sala, uh, Stu Suitable Boy, I used to think it's long form cinema. I'm just going right. to make a six hour film, but it's not. On television, because of the, peop the people's eyes that are looking at it and who are so used to the action and who are so used to the bludgeoning, as I call <laughs> it, um, you have to kind of, uh, not surrender to it, but find a way to make that vocabulary your own, you know? Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm investigating that very much with what I've just done with National Treasure, but certainly with the next series I'm going to make, which is The Jungle Prince of Delhi uh, for Amazon, um, where, you know, we are working with writers uh, to conceive of a story that is not only sort of lugubrious, you know, but actually more, uh, shifting planes of action, because it is also about memory, it's right. also about trauma, it's also about displacement. And that also lends itself to a, you could say, a kind of jagged, but very thought through vocabulary, you know. With making a feature film, that would be a question. You that know, was, that would be a real question. My question was. Yeah, yeah, that would be a real question, but that is uh, something that is familiar to me. You know, like right. I've made feature films uh, for, for many years. Um, and it depends again on the nature of the subject. The one I'm doing now with uh, Pharrell Williams is 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 about again two worlds and race and I, you know a lot of to do with what is our notion of color, you know, who you know, like and all of that. So it gives me a lot of fodder to actually be not necessarily. Uh, I don't know how to put it, but not necessarily like an unfolding that is gentle and meandering, but also uh, dislocation, about dislocation. So yes, the pace has shifted today. You know, it's very hard to uh, see Money Call, even though I adore him, I love him, but it's like, who will watch him today, you know? Uh, yeah. And who watched him even at that time, in the popular sense of the word of watching? but. I still revere those movies of, of like seasons unfolding, but it is a different pace, I have to agree, you know, both in cinema as well as in, certainly in television. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. I'll just come back to you. Or we'll take both the questions yeah. together. Yes. It's on, it's on. Oh. It's a pleasure, rather, it's a matter of proud to be here and listening to you live. Thank you, thank you. Uh, usually, I feel confused when people say it's a classical form of art or it's a commercial form of art, or usually say, whenever it is a music, movies, writings, when I see your movies, I just say they, these are art. Rather, each sphere of universe, each sphere of people I've seen loving your movies. You have just broke the barriers saying it's a classical art or it's a commercial art or it is for the common people or it is for the more literary class. So how you do that? That's Hold that answer. Let's give the, because we have one more question and then answer both. Okay, thank you. But thank you so much. <laughs> On a lighter note, Mira, Tell us something about your yoga enthusiasm. <laughs> so how have you broken the barrier between art and... Uh, well, I grew up with two older brothers. And uh, when you grew up with two older brothers who tease the daylights out of you, you have to learn very young to deserve an audience. And, and, uh, and arty farty, which is what they used to, of course, uh, say about anything that was art, or you know, if we saw that at all, uh, was uh, it's about... So there was no room for pretension in my childhood and in my growing up, you know, and it's still the same. And I really thank them for that because um, they were, you know, they used to rip it to shreds when you're trying to pretend something, you know. So I guess that was my first lesson in how to find an audience and how to uh, cut through the crap that most people sometimes can fake by saying, you know, uh, cast a beautiful person and put some light on them or whatever it is that would might create a good story. Um, it's how to get to the essence of things, you know. And the beauty of life is that the stories are literally everywhere and, and people 
uh, f for me, uh, nothing is more powerful than this truth is much more powerful than fiction can ever concoct. And uh, being coming to it from the street, as I have in the theater, as well as in documentary film, uh, gave me that desire to make fiction film that had that electricity and that unpredictability of what life it gives you, you know? Um, so I guess that's how, uh, for me, that is the, that is the that is the lightning rod that uh, when I just stay away from pretend, pretense is my thing. And in terms of yoga, thank you for asking. I am uh, if I have one guru in the world, it would be B K S Iyengar, uh, who taught, uh, uh, who teaches uh, still, even though his body is gone. Uh, classical Iyengar yoga. Um, I believe that um, that it also really. It, uh, you know, so I've been practicing for about 25 years. Um, I, I, the only Hollywood perk I ask uh, in my film, in my film setup, is to ask for a senior Iyengar yoga instructor uh, to, uh, to be a part of the crew. Because when I turned 40 and made Monsoon Wedding, I, I was tired of being wrecked after every movie because we would, of course, abandon everything while shooting. But now I have a, a, a teacher, and and the whole crew uh, is invited as well as actors to to practice every day, um, and it keeps us elastic, and it keeps us um, strong, and I have a belief that it keeps us egoless because the ego is is not uh, it's a necessary thing, but it's not really uh, helpful uh, when you work uh, like we have to work collaboratively in in cinema. Um, and that's what that's what I I love to practice and um, yeah so that, that so for me it's a, it's part of, it's part of creativity it also teaches you uh, resistance and surrender you know when to resist when to surrender which is a key part of making any work because if you can't demand from an actor you do this uh, better you know you have to find another way to get them to open their hearts you know. And I think it just feeds us all. So. I see. How lovely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. So you know there are a lot of similarities in the challenges faced by the U.S. and India. One difference we see in India is there is a state, certain state-sponsored. Uh, narrative, right, and and movies being made over the last two, three, four years, are that are presenting these historically revised narratives, getting tax exemptions, being watched constantly. You know, I work in a thousand villages in India, and I've dis <laughs> developed this disdain for popular Bollywood cinema because it's giving this narrative that is increasing divides. I mean, we know what you know all of these movies. How do we provide a counter narrative to this? that is equally popular, reaches the same people, and preaches the Indianness that we all believe in, love, you know. Roughly uh, the same question. Wow. <laughs> it's a beautiful question, and it's a beautiful desire, and a hope that we must do. <laughs> but the answer to that question is, perhaps in what the Iranians did, you know, with censorship, because censorship is so, it, it, it's so high in our country, um, in so many ways, camouflaged in some ways and endorsed and spoken about in other ways. And I've faced it all my life here, you know. Um, but I think what the Iranians always showed us is how to make great poetic potency, you know, within censorship. Not that I, I have good friends uh, as th their directors, Asghar Farhadi, and he hates censorship, and he says, do not tell me that censorship will create, foment creativity, you know, because I can't stand it, and he'll, he'll talk like that. But the fact is that they have made, uh, they have chosen the sort of vernacular of their, of their own place, whether it be how a court proceeds, or whether it be how a criminal is, whatever, whatever the stories are. Um, in a way that is acceptable or allowed to happen and yet becomes popular. Perhaps it's that. Um, but I hope, you know, f for me, I, I, I just hope it's in the 
treatment of subjects, it's in the treatment of our music, it's our music is so deliciously subversive in so many ways, you know, and we have told these mischievous tales from so far, for instance, that I would love to use those ways also, because again, we, if you're talking about reaching the people, or reaching our 1,000 villages, it's a very different, world than reaching Amazon, you know, Jungle Prince, you know. It's very different world than reaching the, pet, you know, temples of cinema or something. And I think in India we've done the, in Jatra for, for, for eons, right, with the, our theater, for instance. So maybe, uh, I'm not saying that I'm thinking in that direction, but maybe therein lies the rub, you know, like that's where we could go. But it is a very daunting task because I think the, I think uh, the eyes are everywhere, you know, and uh, they will. St they, they are at least being uh, becoming very adept in smelling the clues of, you know, anything that could be considered subversive. So that is a very tough place to be in, but we have to find a way. Yeah. But just for the record, uh, state um, support or state sort of furthering a narrative, the CIA through the 70s and 80s into the 90s, had a 33% budget intervention into films that promoted American culture, behind which they sold then McDonald's and Coca-Cola and whatever else they have. And that continues to be, they do less films today, but you can still access the CIA. I mean, it's not called CIA grant anymore, it's called uh, State Department grant, and it comes through complicated ways, but it's there. Okay, Kritika is saying uh, uh, to stop, so yeah. thank you all so much. Thank you, Meera thank Nair, you. Uh, for being here. We'll continue the conversation with Meera this evening around Monsoon Wedding, both the film and, of course, the musical, uh, which will uh, be back on stage later that year. So those of you interested, I think it'll possibly be here because of the rain, but we'll let your butlers will let you know where the conversation and the cocktail and the dinner and the screening will be. Meera Nair, thank you so much.